sinus and transverse, along with pedicles and facets. We had the compression fracture. Here, I also added in the word burst fracture. Right, so compression and burst fractures are really similar. The only difference here is that compression, it's the front part of the spine that you see a change in height in. For a burst fracture, the entire spine has kind of fractured and compressed and smushed together. Right, so a compression fracture is kind of like a wedge, right? It squishes forwards in the front. A burst fracture completely breaks as it gets smushed in. Okay, so this here right, is an example of an, a burst fracture, right? The entire spine, rather than just the front, has been fractured and smushed. Okay, hangman fracture, this is the one that deals with the C2, the pedicle and pars into intraarticularis of C2. Right here. Right. So not dealing with the dens though. The dens is a different fracture. Was, was there another name for the hangman fracture? Or, um, another name for it? Mm, no. Not that I'm aware of. Oh, okay. you, I'm not sure if you may have found one in your research, but only have hangman here. Okay, Jefferson fracture. So this one is of C1 instead of C2, right? Hangman, C2. Jefferson, C1. Okay, once again, this time dealing with the arches here, the anterior and posterior arches. All right, and that's where we left off last week. Today, start of a new fracture, a dontoid fracture. Okay, so once again, with the C-spine, two very important vertebrae to know are C1 and C2. What is the other name for C1? Atlas. 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 And then what is the name for C2? Axis. axis. Very good. The axis, C2, has this thing sticking up. Anyone remember the name of this thing sticking up here? Right, this is the dens, also known as the odontoid process. Okay, so you do need to know both names for this part that sticks up out of C2. This is important because this is what lets the head swivel. And this is also a site of fracture. So we actually have a specific type of x-ray to visualize the dens, or the odontoid process. And that x-ray is called the open mouth odontoid. You literally just have the patient open up their mouth, ah, uh, and you shoot your x-ray beam right through it. Why? Opening up their mouth gets their teeth out of the way, and then you can see the odontoid process through the mouth. Okay. Our job when we do that is to check the entire odontoid process, the tip all the way down to the base all the way down to these lateral masses. So we want to be able to see the whole odontoid when we do those x-rays. And so we have our odontoid fracture or our dense fracture, basically just a transverse fracture here that breaks through part of this process, either the tip or the whole thing. So here is our open mouth. In this case, the patient did not open their mouth up very wide. So the image doesn't look as good. But here, you can see the lateral masses of C2. And here is the odontoid. Do you see the odontoid right there? And do you see the fracture? Do you see the fracture of the odontoid here? Yes. Yeah. Right there, right? Yeah. So it's broken up this entire tip. Yeah. Like the entire process has been fractured. Okay, over here. Can you see it on the right image? Yes. yes. Same thing, right? We've got our C2 right here. Here's that odontoid. And here's that fracture right across. What is that? 
I said they're missing a couple of feet. They're missing a couple of feet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Right, and then over here, why do you think it's really bright white? Oh, the filling stuff. Right, it's got some sort of filling. Sir, yes. that odontic thing is, uh, it's all the way, all those crap. Oh, that is the, the that's the odontoid fracture, sir. This is the odontoid process, the fractures here. Only that this, was... Yes, this is supposed to be connected to this bottom part here. I see, to the bottom is this... I see, mm -hmm. sir, thank you. So the bottom and the top have been fractured, right? Have been separated by that fracture. There was one guy that we had, he had like a seizure and mm -hmm. So, how did they eventually? Did they just eventually end up getting lucky, or how did they yeah, end up getting lucky? Yeah, they had to get lucky. Yeah. He really, really liked like the transport lady. Oh. He was like, oh, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. So, okay. she said, stay still. And she did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, something else you could do, and maybe in that situation, now it's not going to give you the best image, but if you could get something like um, some gauze or something to kind of like put in between the teeth for him to like fight down on and that way it keeps the mouth open better than having a talker just pop 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 and you're hoping please let me shoot this at the right time okay next fracture we have here is the teardrop burst fracture you'll notice that for a lot of these that aren't going to be like of the odontoid they're best visualized with the lateral c spine x-ray Right, same for this one, lateral C spine view. Okay. This one is caused by compression and hyperflexion of the cervical spine. So compression, right, being pushed down and hyperflexion being pushed forwards at the same time. Right, so in this case, diving accident or motor vehicle accident, right? Person dives, right, their head hits the water, water forces their head down like that, mm. causes a teardrop burst fracture. Okay. This is an avulsion fracture. What do we mean by avulsion fracture? <laughs> Great, so we've got ligament tearing off. So we've got the, um, let's see here. Okay, so we've got our ligament or right here in the front and it pulls off this piece of the bone right there, this corner of the bone. Okay, so it looks kind of like a teardrop shape. Okay. This triangular fragment looks kind of like a teardrop. In addition, there may be a tearing of the ligament here in the back as well, connecting the spinous process. Like this tearing of the ligament is not a fracture, right? Ligaments being injured is not a fracture, right? Fracture is gonna be of the bone. Right, but along with the teardrop fracture, you may also get the tearing of the ligament. Sorry, so the one on the right side is also a ligament tear. So the one on the right side is a ligament tear. Also a ligament tear. Not also. This is the ligament tear. So we saw one over there? This, there's no ligament tear. Here. This, one, or this one here is your actual fracture of the bone, not the ligament. And is this related to that fact fracture, sir? Same accident causing both, yes. Oh, I see, that's a ligament tear. Okay, so if we look over here, do you see the teardrop? Yes. yes. Where is it? Good, down here by the fork, right, right here. Right, so there's that fracture. Good, how about over here? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. All right, great. Yep. Here's that piece right there. Would that also be like the, the, the Dorito or the butterfly fracture? No. Remember, for a butterfly, you need three pieces. Okay, and butterfly is mainly with long bones. All right. So that finishes off our fractures.
Next up, we have HNP, herniated nucleus pulposus. The more common term for this is a herniated disc or a slipped disc. So have you heard? So has anyone had one or anyone know anyone that's had one of these? Jay? No people that have. No people who've had a slipped disc? So what's going on here? Basically, in between the bodies of your vertebrae, you have this disc, this intervertebral disc. And it acts as cushioning for the vertebrae, right? It acts as kind of like the shock absorbers of your car, in a way. So it fills up the space in between your vertebrae. Now, the disc is supposed to stay perfectly here between your vertebrae. But if too much pressure is placed on this disc, when you push, push down, it may begin to squeeze outwards. And when it squeezes outwards, it may squeeze posteriorly. Now, what is posterior to the body of this vertebrae? The That's right. It's the area where you find the nerves, right? So, you've got your spinal canal right here. The disc is protruding there. It protrudes and impinges onto the spinal cord, right? Or the spinal nerves. And when you have something pushing against the nerves like that, it will cause pain. Or it may cause numbness or loss of sensation in the lower limbs. It may cause um, feelings that radiate out towards the lower limbs, right? So if someone says, I feel like tingling or pain down by my feet, why are they doing an x-ray of my spine? It may be because the doctor suspects that the real origin of that feeling is coming from the spine, from the nerves here, rather than from something actually in the feet. So this is most common in the lumbar spine. Now, will you be able to see this directly on x-ray? No, not really. You will be able to see that the space is narrower between the vertebrae, but you won't really be able to see this protruding out all that well. So the best modality for this is MRI. So these are some MRI images of the spine. If you look here on the first one, right, you see the spine here, spine, spine, you see the vertebrae right there? Yes. And in between this vertebrae, this black area, right, these are those intervertebral discs. Do you see that? Yes. And then back here, you have the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Yes. Do you see where one of the discs protrudes into the spinal cord? Mm -hmm. Four ish. Four ish. Okay. So this is two, three, four, five. Where do you see it? Six. Six. I was counting the. Oh, between six and seven. There we go. See that bump there? Yes. Right? So the disc is being squished out and pushed into the spinal cord. Very good. All right, great. How about on this right image? Okay, so once again, we've got our vertebrae, right? And then we've got our disc spaces in between. That's what that was. Well, that is I so think clear. that's L5. 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 Let's see. Oh, yeah. It's a lot more clear on that one. But you can also see it over here a bit, right? Right here between the lumbar and the sacrum, right? You see how everything here is along the edge, and suddenly this thing goes boop and pops out. Right? So that is our herniated disc, our slip disc. Herniated nucleus pulposus. Is it possible to have more than one? Yes. It does uh, cause us, I think it's pronounced sciatica. Sciatica, so is, yes. Is that just numbness or is that something else? No. Um, I just look it up. Good question. I don't actually recall the, the definition of sciatica. Cody. Yeah. Yeah.
Could you say it happens when there's pressure? Like the spine gets so pushed out? Yeah. How does that happen? Like when something falls on the patient? So let's see, surgery, they may require surgery. Honestly, probably age. Yeah. Yeah. Since when? Since when? Since when? Since when? Since when? It's not like, it wasn't like specifically just chiropractor, it was they did x-rays, they did mm -hmm. exams, and it was just PT. I do think yeah, massages yeah, do help like you. Like physical though. therapy, yes. I didn't, I didn't ask them to like do any popping or anything <laughs> like that. I was uncomfortable with that. So mm -hmm. they just like right. made sure everything was still aligned mm -hmm. and then uh, showed me certain like neck exercises to straighten this back out. Okay. So really, what is the difference between okay. this? The different exercises. Puts you back into place? I won't get into that. I'll, I'll do no surgery. Anyway, uh, so sciatica, down here, down by L4, L5, the spinal cord begins to split, right? And it needs to split because it needs to turn into nerves that travel down the legs, right? So down around here, you get that sciatic nerve coming out. Mm -hmm. And so sciatica is pain along the sciatic nerve. What is that sciatica? S C. S C. I. Sciatica. Oh, I see. You have the you have the slide. So next up, kyphosis. So in which spine do we see kyphosis? T spine. Which one? T spine. T spine. So which spine so which spine normally C. has kyphosis? C. C. Are you asking the vertebra specifically? So which spine normally demonstrates kyphosis? C T L S. C. It's still the it's no. T spine. T spine, oh. yes. Right? So yeah. right? Right? the T spine has a natural curve. It has a natural curve that is kyphotic, right? If you're looking from the front, it's a concave mm -hmm. curve. However, that's not what we're talking about here in terms of kyphosis. Here, we're talking about an exaggerated mm. curve. Okay, but, um, by the way, I should, oh, no, I'll fix that later. Right, so, Sorry, this was using the old book, which was looking at things from the back for some reason. So this is convex towards the back, right? It is pushing out significantly more than it should towards the back, right? It's basically like hunchback, mm -hmm. okay? So this is kyphosis. This is abnormal kyphosis. Normally the spine does have a kyphotic curve, but this is abnormal kyphosis, okay? Why does this happen? Well, it could be due to compression fractures. Remember, we said that a compression fracture is where the front of the vertebrae gets smushed, so it turns into a wedge, right? So if the vertebrae turns into a wedge, the spine is gonna kind of lean forward a little bit more to follow that wedge. So if you take a look at the spine right here, if you take a look at these vertebrae, do you notice anything interesting about them? Especially near the middle. It's like they're it's sort like of get smaller, like they're, yeah, yeah, right in the area. Yeah, smaller. you see these almost yes. triangular, right? Mm -hmm. They're getting smaller, right? Wedge-like. Wedge-like, mm -hmm. exactly. Right. So, there is our kyphosis. Okay. What else can cause this? Poor posture. Right. So hopefully everyone is sitting up properly and not slouching down. <laughs> Now you know. Okay. Rickets. Anyone remember what rickets was? Softening of the bone. Right? The bone is soft, it becomes easier for 
these compression fractures to occur. Okay, so this is kyphosis. You good? Dr. Beck? Yeah. Yes. I'll do the just the normal spine. So it would be like a lower doses than a kyphosis and the lower doses? Correct. So normal spine, C spine has a lordotic curve, T spine has a kyphotic curve. L spine has a lordotic curve, sacrum has a kyphotic curve. Okay. Does it depend on where you're looking at it? Well, lordosis and kyphosis are set. It's a concave context that depends where you're looking at it. Okay, so for this one, lordosis. Okay, once again, so this is looking from the back. From the back, if you look this way, right, it curves inward. So this is concave, right? But if you're looking from the front, it curves forward. So just keep in mind which way you're looking at it from. Okay, so make a note, right? This is looking at it from the back. Make a note each way. So, so this bullet point here, where it says concave curvature, mm -hmm. we're looking at it from the back for it to be concave. Okay. Whichever one. You need to know both, right? If I ask you about it from the front, you need to know it's convex. If I ask you from the back, you need to know it's concave. So just think about how you're looking at it and then which way it's traveling. If it helps, right? Lordosis is usually more straightforward. Lordosis doesn't matter if you're looking from the front or the back, it's always a curvature like this. So, once again, lumbar spine has a normal lordotic curve. It's supposed to be in lordosis. But once, just like with kyphosis, this curve can become exaggerated. It, become, it can become bigger than it's supposed to be. So what can cause this abnormal curvature? Pregnancy. Right? So wait in the front, right? Please person tries to lean back to kind of counterbalance it, adds this additional strain of the position curvature. Okay, obesity, same idea, poor posture, same idea. Rickets, right? Osteomalacia, once again, softening of the spine. And also tuberculosis of the spine. So for kyphosis and lordosis, if you want to see them, you need to do lateral view. You need to do lateral views of the spine, right? Because it's all about going forwards or backwards. And so a lateral view will show you if something goes forwards or backwards. On the other hand, we have scoliosis. So do not confuse scoliosis with lordosis or kyphosis. Scoliosis, easy way to remember it, S. Spine looks like an S shape now. The spine goes side to side, left to right. So it's an abnormal or exaggerated lateral curvature of the spine. The right? spine is supposed to go straight down, MSP, but now it's moving side to side. Um, this is most common in children and may require treatment with a back brace. We do have a special x-ray series to demonstrate scoliosis. And it is called the Scoliosis Series. Okay. So we do have a Scoliosis Series. And Nick, can you explain what's so special about that Scoliosis Series? Well, they use this cool function called stitching. So you're able to take like multiple shots of the spine and then it stitches it together as one image. That's right. So and normally, you do that for the femur and like your like whole leg too, mm -hmm. like all bones. So how many do they usually take? It's like at Bow Clinic. Anybody been to Bow Clinic? Mm -hmm. I've been there, but yeah. yeah, they do them there. You can see it there. You'll see they'll have like this cool ruler thing. The uh, what was it called? What's it called? Oh, I don't know. I forgot. Ruler. We just talked about it. We Wait. What? Oh, we know. know the thing that you measure your hip with. Oh, 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 no, not no, 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 it's like a, it's, a meter state. It's like a reference thing. Yeah, so they put it next to their body for the long course, and then it's kind of like it's the tube is angled like this, 
and then it just angles up and it just like captures the whole image. Mm -hmm. right. I don't know, it on the system. Mm -hmm. All, yeah, it basically is. <laughs> right, so normally, right, we are constrained to our 14 by 17. Right? But in the case of our scoliosis series, right, by taking multiple shots like this, all the way up and down the spine, you can get a full picture from like C spine all the way down to L spine. All right, so not that, right? That is not a scoliosis series. <laughs> okay, um, metastasis, we've talked about metastasis before, right? So it's just cancer that spreads, right? So it is malignant. Um, so in this case, just gonna throw in two more vocabulary words. Osteolytic, osteoblastic. Lytic. What does lytic mean? Lysis, lytic? Destroy. Destroy, destruction, right? Osteo? Bone. 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 So what does the cancer do? Bone destruction, destroys the bone, great. And then you have osteoblastic. This one is the opposite of lytic. So what do you think it is? Bone. Uh, That's right, growth, construction. So bone construction, bone growth. It creates new bone. So there's a cancer that destroys bone and there's a cancer that creates unwanted new bone. Okay, so osteolytic, osteoplastic. One takes away bone mass, one adds bone mass. And of course, x-ray, not the best to not the best tool to image cancer with. So we can use CT, MRI, or nuclear medicine. Now, with that said, we do do x-rays. Um, yes, Angelica. Uh, so like all the black on there is mm -hmm. like cancer? Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. So the black areas are areas with cancer. Mm -hmm. So with that said, we do do some x-rays to look at um, cancer, even in the spine, right? and that is our bone survey. Has anyone done a bone survey? Yes. It's too Good. much. I mean, okay, Nick, so go ahead and tell us about it. They're uh, very long, it's a lot of exams. It's kind of like you're doing a capstone. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it's, it goes from like head work, spine, mm -hmm. hip, I think that's it, right? And then, um, Oh yeah, yeah. So, close extremities. So do but it's not like every view. Mm -hmm. It's more like a more like AP stuff. So. Mm -hmm. And just combine all those pictures and make it like that? No, 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 no. no. It's just no. individual. No. The doctors look at them separately. So there's about like 16 or 17 images, right? And you're like AP and lateral head, C spine, T spine, L spine. You have your AP pelvis, and then you've got um, like APs of the Humerus and femurs as well. Smith Clinic. Something like that in the outpatient. Outpatient. And LBJ and Smith Clinic. Or the singing. We've seen so many that we should. When you were singing, you were Smith Clinic? Yeah. 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 It was almost done too. Saying so so um, something nice about bone survey is not missing much. as far as students go. If you as a student run into a bone survey, mm. you can use that to comp on the anatomy in that bone survey. Specifically, what do students look for? The skull. Skull. Skull is hard to find normally. But if you get a bone survey, it includes AP and lateral skull. So you can use that for your skull comp. Okay, so keep that in mind. You can use a bone survey to get your skull comp. Yes. Next semester. <laughs> Starting next semester. Next. Yes. Question, so, that, so all this will go, you know how, uh, say for instance, you need an elbow mm -hmm. and a- Can I comp on that thing? Uh, <laughs> like an elbow and a forearm, and then say it's, uh, L spine and a hip. 
you know how you always y'all always tell us, well, you got to do the whole thing in order to get yes. the comp. So if we gonna do this next semester. So you gotta do all. So you know, you get what I'm saying? Like, right. we, if we yeah. haven't covered it yet, I mean, if we right. covered it yet, or mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm saying. But I'm <laughs> so tired. he knows. So let's say that. Mm -hmm. Let's say that for whatever reason, you want to use your bone surface comp on a pelvis, which you will do at the end of the semester, right? And you're like, all right, I'm going to comp on my pelvis yeah. using the bone survey, but I've not learned how to do spine, I have not learned how to do head work. Okay. Can I still comp on this? Mm -hmm. Short answer is yeah. yes. Um, as long as the tech isn't helping you with the pelvis part, and they're just kind of like guiding you through the rest, I am... Um, okay with it but it can't be that the tech just takes over and starts doing everything else right you should still be the one primarily doing the position the tech should just help you all right center here instead center okay. here instead center here instead right so they're, they can guide you through the parts the other parts that you haven't covered yet but still you should be the primary person doing the exam oh, okay. oh i am okay okay yes John. does the skull survey or the uh, survey come with uh, one accession number or is it multiple? One accession number. So only one count in the whole thing? Correct. <laughs> oh, and you can get two, right? Can't you get two? No. no. Two per patient, per one per accession number. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Next <laughs> up, osteoarthritis. Okay. Old friend. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you said right. Oh. <laughs> What's the other name for our osteoarthritis? Degenerative joint disease. Right, DJD, degenerative joint disease. Right, in this case, we're talking about the spine. So, what joints does the spine have? Well, okay, where, where do we find joints in the spine? What am I Between the vertebrae. Right, between the vertebrae, right? What do we find between the vertebrae? Right, the cartilage, those discs, right? So in this case, we're losing the disc spaces. Okay. And we're also getting a hardening of the bone. We call that sclerosis. Right? Sclerosis, hardening. Right? You may it may sound familiar, right? Because you may have heard of like arterial sclerosis, right? Mm -hmm. Hardening of the arteries. Right? Same idea, right? In this case, we have bony sclerosis, hardening of the bone. Right? So, for example, you take a look here, right? You see a joint space here, relatively open. You see joint space here, relatively open. But look between L3 and L4. Look at how narrow this joint space is. Mm -hmm. right? It's like worn away. It's disappeared. That's what we're talking about in terms of spine, um, spinal osteoarthritis. Also, all the cartilages are different sizes, right? The space between them. They're all not the same, correct? So, in a healthy person, the spaces, the spaces should be generally the same size. They should be approximately the same size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you said L3 and L4. L4. And L3, this is one, the, L3. the cartilage is one of them. Correct. That's why these two are so close to each other. Uh, next up, we have Schuerman disease. This is also called juvenile kyphosis. If you take a look, what do you see happening to the spine? What is this? That's right, a natural curve, right? Giant C, right? Kyphosis. But this is not just kyphosis. This may also come with scoliosis as well. So not only is the spine affected front to back, right? It's also affected side to side. All right, so this one is called juvenile kyphosis because it happens in younger patients, typically in adolescents. Um, this is more common in males than females for whatever reason. Um, it's based the degree of the kyphosis is based on something called the Sorison criteria. Don't need to really know this. 
just pretending there's a bit of trivia for you, just for fun. Right, main thing to know, right, is that this one is the juvenile kyphosis. Or, so juvenile adolescence, right, kyphosis plus scoliosis. How do we view this? Scoliosis series, AP and lateral. Spina bifida. Now this one is interesting. This one happens when the spinous process fails to form because the posterior parts did not properly close. Right, so here's our normal vertebrae, spinous process. Over here, the lamina didn't connect to form the spinous process. So now you have this opening in the back of the spine. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. So this part right, is missing the spinous process. There's an opening here in the back of the spine. So this is a concern because now the spinal cord is no longer constrained to this tunnel, right? It has an ability to leave. And so you get this protrusion back here. Right? So you get a protrusion of this spinal canal out the back of the spine. Okay? This is a congenital condition, right? So it is something that a patient is born with when that part of when that spinous process fails to develop. And this usually happens in the lumbar spine around L5. Is that for parents? I mean, do they fix this? Um, the yes. The hairy patch, is that the nerves or is the hair? That's hair. What? That's hair? That's, That's hair. Mm -hmm. um, can they fix this? Yeah. Um, Are there like some type of correction or? So good question. I think they should be able to do surgery for it, um, but to be honest, um, not sure. So from from left to right of these images, it's just the process of going. Mm -hmm. Like it starts off on the left and it just progresses to the right. right. So this would be how it starts, and then from here it would form what's called a meningeal seal, mm -hmm. where the meninges, which is this part around the spinal cord starts to protrude outside. And then afterwards, we have a myelomeningeal seal. Milo being the nerves, right? Nerves follow the meninges outwards. But yes, the cause of all of this is that spinal bifida, yeah. that incomplete formation of the vertebrae. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the hairy patch should be something visible from the outside. The ultrasound is something that would be done, however, before the baby is born. Ooh. So prenatal oh, okay. ultrasound. So they can see it. Mm -hmm. So they can yeah. check for that early. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see here. Okay. Do you see the spinal bifida in this KUP? I'm fixing. <laughs> uh, what do you guys? Like, all right. Well, how am I supposed to look for spinal bifida in a KUP, right? Well, think about spinal bifida. What should be? What should you see that you don't see? That's right. In the middle of the pelvis. You should see a spinous process right here. Correct. Right. You have your lumbar spine, spinous. Right, so spinous process, spinous process, spinous process, spinous process. Where's the spinous process? Right, mm -hmm. so that is your hint of spinal bifida. So spinous process is missing, sir? Spinous process is missing, that is the definition. Mm -hmm. And then over here, we have a CT scan. Mm -hmm. So this is like if we're looking from the bottom of the patient. Mm -hmm. And so here's that vertebrae, and here's that missing spinous process, right? Lamina, lamina, no spinous process. So it's open in the back here. Okay, almost done, guys. Almost done. Yes, go ahead. Um, just a quick question about like CT and MRI. Like, is there something that 
do you generally see more like like a difference between the two? Like if you're going to CT, they're like going to like see this instead of like going to MRI. Yes. Yeah, so CT, generally speaking, is better for bony structures. MRI is better for soft tissues like muscles, tendons, ligaments. Okay. Um, in addition, CT is a faster modality. Scans take maybe five minutes maximum. MRI much slower. Scans take 20 minutes minimum. Um, but the detail they give is also is going to be quite different. And of course, you also have to just consider things like patient dose, right? If you have a pregnant patient, do you want to put them through a CT? Probably not, maybe MRI instead in that case. Mm -hmm. If you've got a patient with metal inside them, do you want them to go through MRI? Eh, probably not, maybe take them in the CT. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Do it also depend on if the patient can afford it? Mm -hmm. Mm, so generally, cost is not going to be on the doctor's mind when they order these exams, honestly speaking. But uh, yeah, some MRI exams are going to be more costly than CT. Um, but doctors will usually not compromise and say, yeah, yeah, we'll go with the cheaper option. Because normally, if they want an MRI, there's something specific that they're looking for that shows up better on MRI compared to CT. And it's not coming out of their pocket, so it doesn't matter. Uh, and it's not coming out of the doctor's pocket, that's true. It's uh, insurance if the patient is lucky and the patient's pocket if they're not so lucky. <laughs> okay, so here we begin the three difficult terminologies. First up is spondylolysis. Spondylolysis. Right? So, Lysis or lysis? No, no, no. I'm not correcting you. I was just saying, I was saying it. No, you're okay. But lysis or lysis, right? We've seen this before. What is that? Lysis. Destruction. Destruction. Right. So in this case, it is going to be a defect, once again, of the pars interarticularis. Okay. It's going to be this area right here. Okay. And so, this Pars interarticularis forms what we call the neck of our Scotty dog. The Scotty dog is something that we see when we do oblique lumbar spine x-rays. Um, by Scotty dog, we mean, um, I think it's called a Scottish Terrier. Have you mm -hmm. seen those dogs? Right, they kind of, Kind of looks like a rectangle dog. almost. I mean, yeah. you've got like a, a re, it's like a rectangle head, rectangle body kind of. Yeah. So a Scotty dog, right? Scottish Terrier, right? So when we do an oblique X-ray, we get something that looks kind of like that. And so we have the head, the neck, and the neck is what looks like it is broken on the X-ray. So, um, sorry, so this one's a lateral, this is not yeah, a little big, so you won't be able to see the Scotty dog. But, do you see the fracture? Yeah. <coughs> right yeah. there, right? Yeah. So there's that fracture of the pars interarticularis. How big is the fracture, Right there. Uh. See, these two are supposed to be connected. Be this is our fracture. Right. Over here, right. you can see the same thing. Right. Got our fracture right there. Right. So this is right. So this is the body. Right. This is our spinous process. Right. And our person to interarticularis was right here in between. Yeah. Right. So you can kind of like right here, head. Like foot, foot, right? Body? The eye. The eye. Oh, eye. Mm -hmm. But yeah, right ear, head, and then the neck was broken. Yeah. Right? Body, leg, leg. So, poor dog got its neck snapped in half. That is spondylolysis. I don't know how you say it there. It kind of sticks 
with me, you know, so I can know how to see it. Okay. Make sure you give context when you say that. <laughs> Who's just sitting there? It's just like that looks like a dog. Like, I don't know. I don't. I look at them like this looks nothing like some kind of animal. You know, it's like it's like looking at clouds, right? You look at clouds and like, oh yeah, yeah. I see a I see a dog in the cloud. And like, no, no, no. That's an airplane. Like, no, that's, you that's, sure that's, about a, that's a hot dog. <laughs> it almost like a burger to me, right? It's like looking in clouds, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, next up, once again, spondylo, but now it is spondylolisthesis. So, in this case, we have our vertebrae here, right, lined up with our sacrum, and now it shifts forward, right? So, this is a subluxation, right? of our vertebrae. Right? It's no longer fully articulating with the sacrum. How is it able to move? Usually because the pars interarticularis got broken. So in other words, spondylolisthesis can lead to spondylolisthesis. So you, it's like a step. We got step one, which was the flat bone, and this is step two. Correct. Oh, right. So Scotty dog gets broken, right? The neck of the Scotty dog gets broken, and now that vertebrae is able to move forwards. So if you take a look here, right? L2, three, four, five. Notice how L4 is in front of L5, mm -hmm. right? And you're like, okay, well, how is it able to move? Well, oh, you see that break right there? Okay. Right, that fracture, that fracture let the vertebrae slide forwards. Right, over here, L3, L4, L5 sacrum. Notice how L5 is in front of the sacrum? Mm -hmm. right. Why was it able to move? Because something, there's a fracture somewhere back here. Not so easy to see on this one. That's why we would want an oblique view as well. Okay, but spondylolisthesis is the sliding forwards of the vertebrae, right? Spondylolisthesis is this break. So this break. Because of the fracture, the six vertebrae mm -hmm. move forward. So which one are you? This one? So so because of this, fra this, this, one? this fracture? Because of the fracture, the fifth vertebrae moves forward. In front of the fourth, fourth, the fourth, fourth vertebrae so moves forward, fifth stays here. So the fourth moved forward. Right, so these are all lined up. Right? These are all, because these are all connected at their parts in charge of the So these are all connected. These will move together. But they have been able to move separately of the fifth one because the connection was broken here. So normally this is all supposed to move as a unit, broke the link in the chain. So everything else is moving together, but not down here. And the, the link in the chain is the spondo lice, spondo mm -hmm. lysis. Right, so breaking the link in the chain, that's the spondo lysis. Like if you want, you can think of these as like, like train cars, right? Mm -hmm. So if you break the connection between some train cars, right? It stays behind it. Right? Now you have two groups, right? One group moves by itself, the second group, and group would move by itself together, but they're not moving all together as a group anymore. Mm -hmm. okay. But there's also just maybe some cases where that necessarily isn't broken, mm -hmm. but it could still move forward. Right, so there are situations where that may happen. Okay. Uh, would the vertebrae, I mean, would the spinal process move too? Yeah. If it was a broken. Mm -hmm. Could that? Yeah, so maybe something happened to like the ligament back here or something. When the spinal process hits the spinal cord, it gets good stuff. Yep. Okay, 
And the final one, spondylolosis. Okay, so spondylolosis. This one is different from the other two. This is just a general degeneration of the spinal column. Okay, so something like osteoarthritis falls under the category of spondylosis. This is spondylosis, degeneration of the spinal column. That was an umbrella term? Umbrella term. Okay, mm -hmm. and the final one to discuss are going to be those transitional vertebrae. So traditional vertebrae, these are not actually a pathology. It doesn't actually cause anything bad for the patient. Right? Usually, we're not even looking for this at all. It's just something that we do an x-ray for a different reason, and then we just happen to notice that there's a transitional vertebrae. Right? So it's not anything that would cause the patient harm or injury. It's just there. And so this is a vertebrae that seems to have characteristics of a neighboring region. For example, C7, cervical spine, should not have ribs coming off it. But sometimes it has these longish rib-like protrusions, but they don't reach all the way to the sternum. Right? So that's a transitional vertebrae, right? It's a C vertebrae, but it acts kind of like a T vertebrae. Or over here, L1, with rib-like protrusions that almost look like a 13th rib. Right? So you're counting your ribs, one, two, three, four, five, you can all lay down to 12, and then you go to the next vertebrae and like, huh, there's something long here as well, almost like a 13th rib, right? Transitional vertebra. Lumbar vertebrae that acts like a thoracic vertebrae. And then finally, you have um, this one here, S1, with a separation from the sacrum, so it looks like a sixth lumbar vertebrae. So you're counting, okay, I see my 12th rib, that's T12, then L1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I should see sacrum, but I see one more vertebrae by itself, almost like L6. Right, so that's this, sacral vertebrae that acts like a lumbar vertebrae. So if you take a look up here, do you see how you can, do you see these ribs coming off the vertebrae here? Yes. Do you see these ribs coming off the vertebrae here? Yes. Do you see any ribs here? No. Any ribs? No ribs there. So this is which vertebrae? T12. This is L1, right? T12 has the last rib. Yes. So this should be L1. So L1, two, three, four, five, six. Uh -oh. Six. Right? Hold on. I shouldn't have six lumbar vertebrae. Right? Transitional vertebrae. Mm -hmm. That's one that looks like, that acts like an L6. Okay. Over here, same thing. Right? So, rib, mm -hmm. rib. So rib goes to? T12. T12, great. No rib. Mm -hmm. So this is L1, mm -hmm. two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this thing that almost looks like its own lumbar vertebrae, right? Mm -hmm. So that's your transitional vertebrae. Looks like an extra, extra or something. It looks like an extra vertebrae. Right? But once again, it's nothing bad, it's nothing negative. That's just how it is. Usually it won't cause any problems for the patient. Do you know what we mean by incidental finding? Yeah, by chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, something else is wrong, you do an x-ray and then you're like, oh, by chance I also happen to find out there's a transitional vertebrae. All right, very good. Yes, John. It only appears after L5. So that's one situation, right? There may be a situation where it shows up like a 13th T spine, a 13th T vertebrae. There may be situations where it shows up like an like T0 almost, an additional T vertebrae. If it pops up as a T13, mm -hmm. wouldn't you just count that as an L since you can't tell? Which one's T13 or T? Right, so in this case, right, let's say that this was a normal L spine. We might see another rib right here. Oh, it would but come with another rib? It looks like a rib, 
but it's not as long as a true rib, right? So you see something long kind of coming out, but it's not long enough to be a true, to be an actual rib. I shouldn't say true rib because that's an actual term, <laughs> right? So, oh, yeah. awesome. right? So you may see something that looks like a rib here, but not long enough for an actual rib. So then you're like, okay, that's a, that's not a, that's not a real rib. That's just a transition over the broom. Oh. Well, yeah. Do you have 11 like ribs, but 12? Like the picture on the right, let's say it uh -huh. wasn't mistaken, but it was like yeah. actually L1 was supposed to be T12. Did I have the muscle? Uh, losing a rib is uh, is definitely going to be some other issue. Okay. That losing a rib is not going to be a transitional vertebra issue. But you get what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. They can confirm, yeah. I mean, it's possible, right? Just based on how genetics works, people can be born without certain things. Could be born without a 12th rib, could be born without a spinous process. So yeah, I would say it's possible, but it would not fall under the category of transitional vertebrae. Okay, right, so that is the entire unit. How are we feeling? Not good. Oh, no. oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. All right.